Let's open our Bibles to Galatians chapter 4. We're going to continue in the book of Galatians. Galatians chapter 4, verses 1 through 7, just a a short portion, but uh, the book of Galatians uh, includes a lot of details. And so we take shorter portions, we try to do an exhaustive study verse by verse through the book. The book is about justification by faith. The book is about a group of Christians that had been saved by hearing the gospel preached. And then some legalists had come in among them and tried to force laws, the Ten Commandments and other Old Testament laws upon them, insinuating that faith in Jesus wasn't enough for salvation, that you needed to add a list of rules in order to maintain and to secure and truly be saved. And so this legalistic group of a Jewish background has come into the churches in the region. They are infiltrating. They are conspiring together. I use some strong words because I believe strong words are needed. They, um, they are influencing in a very negative way uh, the Christians that Paul is writing to. And so he is combating their influence asking the Galatians to question themselves, to to remember how it was that they got saved, that they got saved through the hearing of the gospel only, not by performing any particular religious deed or ceremony or anything like that, that God had given them his spirit, poured out his spirit among them, not because they performed some list of rules perfectly, but because they had faith in Jesus Christ. And so he's, that's the flavor, that's the tone of the letter here. Uh, This morning we look at the difference between thinking like a child and thinking like an adult in regards to faith. So let me read these seven verses. We'll have a word of prayer and we'll dive in. Now I say that the heir, as long as he is a child, does not differ at all from a slave, though he is master of all. But he is under guardians and stewards until the time appointed by the father. Even so we, in a similar way, when we were children, spiritually speaking, We were in bondage under the elements of the world. But when the fullness of the time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under law, to redeem those who were under the law, that we might receive the adoption as sons. And because you are sons, it's a fact, if you have faith in Christ, you're a son or a daughter of of God. Because you are his children, God has sent forth the spirit of his son into your hearts, crying out, Abba, Father, therefore you are no longer a slave, but a son, and if a son, then an heir of God through Christ. So, join me in prayer if you would. Lord, help us to take this all in. Help us to to understand it clearly, thoroughly, Lord. And then, Lord, by your spirit, God, would you help us to make application in our lives, Lord. This has to mean something for us today. Maybe even very significant as we start the new year, Lord. May we uh, not have long lists of resolutions, but may we, ha- may we have one purpose, to trust in you in everything, Lord, and to love you with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. So, Lord, would you make application to our lives, God? Would you help us to see how and why this should change our lives, we who follow Jesus? Thank you, Lord. And we pray in your name, Jesus. Thank you. Amen. So, the Apostle Paul here is making some some comparisons, and we're going to kind of divide this thing up in two, verses 1 to 3, and then verses 4 to 7. He talks about something that the culture that his readers would have known well. He talks about how children live in that Roman and that Greek culture. I'm going to give you some definitions here. I love words, and words are important, and words mean something, and uh, everybody should have a dictionary. If you don't have a dictionary, Pastor Vince will buy you one, so... uh, (laughs) Thank you so much, Pastor Vince. Um, keep a dictionary handy. And uh, if, you, if you're a student of the Bible, guys, there's so many free resources online. I just want to encourage you, uh, if you're you know, reading through the Bible um, daily, I hope you are, if you're a follower of Jesus. And even if you're not, pick it up and read it and, and say, God, if you're there, speak to me. But if you're a follower of Jesus, it's so easy to have your laptop open and just have a little commentary there. And just there's so many, so many free resources um, Get a hold of me if you need some direction in that. But I love, I love the words that, that, that the Spirit of God has inspired uh, the writers of the Bible to write. And so we're going to look at some definitions here. 
He speaks to them of a condition and a situation that they know. He speaks to them of, of a young child being under the care of a guardian. So he says, I, verse 1, I say that, that the heir, as long as he is a child, does not differ at all from a slave, though he is master of all. He speaks here of a young child who has not, quote unquote, yet come of age. They're, they're, he, they, we'll, we'll just use a young, a young boy for, for an example. A young boy who has not hit about the age of 14 or 15 or something like that when he is considered moving into manhood, when his status in the family changes. While he's a young boy, though he will someday be the master of his father's household, though he will someday receive an, an inheritance from his father, and though he will someday be the actual owner of that slave that's taking care of him, for now the slave is over him. The one that he is going to be served by is, is now watching over him and guarding him and restraining him, trying to teach him some morality, trying to teach him whatever religious, spiritual base the family holds to, whether it be uh, some kind of form of Judaism or even heathenism has some kind of moral uh, principles and laws and, and, and guidance uh, you know, about how to live the life. And so the young child would live under that tutorship, under that guardianship, until a certain age, then they would receive a toga called the toga virilis. It was kind of a ceremony. In, in the Mexican culture, for the girls who turn 15, they have a thing called a quinceanera. Very, very big deal. If you don't know about it, it's a big deal. It's, it's, it's a big deal. Anyway, it's kind of a, a ceremony and a celebration of, of a gal moving into womanhood. This was the, kind of the same idea there in the Roman and Greek culture. The, the young boy would now be considered a man. But Paul says here, verse 1, I say that the heir, the eventual heir, as long as he is a child, does not differ at all from a slave, though he is master of all. Look at your notes here. The word child means one that does not speak. <laughs> Maybe that's where the old phrase came from, huh? Children should be seen and not heard. I don't agree with that. We need to listen to our children. But in that day, that word meant one that does not speak or one who is intellectually and morally immature. So children, as wonderful as they are, they need guidance. My wife and I have five grandkids now. They need guidance. They need oversight. If you have children, they need oversight. If you have grandchildren, they need oversight. Nieces and nephews, uh, younger siblings, whoever they might be, they need oversight. They need you to guide them. May I encourage you two parents, and, and uh, this may not be for you because you guys are here and presumably your kids are in the children's ministry, but I hear people out there sometimes, adults saying, well, I don't want to shove religion down my kid's throat. I understand the sentiment of that. You don't want to force them to be something they're not interested in. But you're teaching them about sports and you're teaching them about morality and you're teaching them about everything else. They need moral and spiritual guidance as well. You're not shoving it down their throat to, to say, this is what I believe. And so uh, I don't buy into that statement as it stands. We don't want to force and we can't force anybody to be anything. But parents need to teach their kids about God, right? Amen, anybody? They need to teach them about the love of God, the holiness of God. So the child here is one that does not speak, one that is intellectually immature, one that needs somebody to help them make decisions, one that morally is, is immature, one that, that doesn't have a good sense of ethics or morality within their heart. Verse one, I say that the heir, as long as he is a child, immature, unable to make his own decisions, does not differ at all from a slave. The word slave there, do lost, a lot of you know that if you study the Bible. The child was like a slave. Now, the Paul, now Paul is making a comparison here. Don't miss it, verse 1. I say that the heir, as long as he is a child, does not differ much from a slave. In some ways, he doesn't differ at all. In some ways, he does differ because eventually he's going to grow out of his childhood and the slave may never gain his freedom. So the slave's condition may be permanent. The child's condition is not permanent until he grows up. But while he's under the, the, the guardianship of, of the slave, they're very similar in this. The child doesn't have the authority to make his own decisions. The eight-year-old doesn't go to dad and say, hey, dad, I think I want to go live over here, and this is what I want to do. No. Excuse me? Do you, do you guys ever watch Bill Cosby, the old Bill Cosby shows? I brought you into this world. I can take you out of it, you know? <laughs> I love the child doesn't tell the dad what to do. The slave doesn't tell the dad what to do. Neither one of them have the authority over their own lives to decide how things should go. So that's one way that they don't differ. 
The child was like a slave who had no authority to make decisions. Verse 1, I say that the heir, as long as he is spiritually immature and morally immature, does not differ at all from the slave who has no authority over his life, though he is the master of all. Someday that kid is going to be the master of all. The word is kurios, and one day he would function as the master. But for now, he was a slave until he graduated. And so Paul's making a very pointed application here that they knew about. And don't miss this, guys. You start like this, but then you go to this. And this whole passage here, these seven verses, is about, is about progression. It's about starting as a child, but not staying childish. He's talking about it. He's going to be talking about a change here. He's going to be talking about when we lived as a child, before you were a Christian, you had to have lists and rules and religion and strictness and governance and all these things because you had no internal change yet. You were being controlled from the outside. But then you were born again and God put his spirit in you and now you have some maturity, hopefully, and are growing in that maturity. And there's, an, there's a sense of morality and ethics and all these other things. There's a godly wisdom that God begins to pour into the person. The Galatians were wanting to go back and say, Dada, Mama, Baba, Gugu. Give me my list of things to do. I don't want to have to think over here like an adult. I just want to have a list. Just tell me how to live. I want to go backwards. Basically, they were going backwards, guys. Verse 1, I say that the heir, as long as he is spiritually immature and morally immature, doesn't differ at all from the slave who has no authority over himself, even though he's one day going to be the master of that slave. Verse 2, that child, that morally immature one, that ethically immature one, is under guardians and stewards until the time appointed by the father. It's going to stay that way until dad says it changes. A couple of definitions. Guardians. Guardians were there to be protective over the child, the, the physical person of the child. The stewards were the ones that protected the future property of the child. He would one day inherit the estate, and so they were guardians of the, of the, of the, of the household and, and, the, and the grounds and all of those things, the belongings. Verse 3. So, first, first of all, verses 1 and 2, child and the slave under the authority of law. That's how the young children lived. The second part of this, he says this was our condition prior to salvation. If you're a follower of Jesus today, you may not have thought this through, as I study the Bible, I realize there's a lot of things I haven't thought through. It's a great thing to study the Bible, a great thing to read. He says, this was your condition, Christian, before you were a Christian. Verse 3, even so we. So, if you're a follower of Jesus, you're part of that we. Even so we. When we were children, so he says, in some ways, you used to be like that child. Even so we, when we were children, were in bondage under the elements of the world. Now, he uses in verse 3 the same Greek word for children. Even when you, Jerry Dorman, even when you, Bill Walden, I have to include myself. If I'm going to take a shot at you, Jerry, i got to take a shot at myself. Even me and Jerry, we, it's hard to believe, but we were intellectually and morally immature. And spirit, we're talking especially spiritually speaking. In regards to the things of God, we were depending on our own immature ethical system. If, there, if we wanted to make any change, all we had to work with was whatever we had on board. He says, verse 3, even so we, when we were children, we were in bondage under the elements of the world. Interesting little phrase here. This is what I think it means. I'm going to read, read my notes here. We were under the elementary stages of the religious experience, whether under Jewish law or some moral system found in heathenism. Now that's Specifically applied to the Galatians, in a broader sense applied to us. The first, principle used, the first principles used to direct and develop a behavior, the elements of the world, the principles of the world. And he's talking here about a system, a system of thought. It may be religious, it may be pop psychology, it might be culture, it might be uh, some mantra, if it feels good, do it. How many of us grew up under that? Yikes. Uh, they didn't tell you that if it feels good, do it, but you'll be in trouble later. <laughs> they forgot to include that. Whatever elements or principles that the world says, this is how you're to govern your life, we grew up under the basic elements and principles. 
Even under the mantra of if it feels good, do it. Was that the 60s or 70s? 70s? Okay. How do you know? You're that old? You're that old? Wow. I didn't... I'm in a silly mood today. <laughs> even, even in the 70s, if, if, if somebody kind of went around and said, hey, if it feels good, do it, you know, and you went up to that person and took their wallet, you can't do that. Hey, if it feels good, do it. I, I, it felt good. I did it. <laughs> you can't tell me. You just said if it feels good, do it. Every, every system of thinking and principles like that has some point where you say, no, you can't do that. If it feels good, do it, unless you're taking my wallet or my car keys. That's a very basic principle of some kind of morality. You find it in the church, you find it out of the church. You find it among people that believe in reincarnation and Hinduism and Buddhism and, and you know, any, anything at all, any, any system of culture, you'll find some place where people will say, you can't do that. And what I'm going to suggest to you is that God writes his laws on our heart. We're going to look at a scripture, Romans chapter 2, verse 14 and 15 in a little bit. God writes his, heart, his law on the conscience of every man's heart. At some point in every system, we'll say, no, you shouldn't do that. And then we'll, look, we'll point to the person next to us and say, no, you shouldn't do that. Or we'll point at ourselves and say, no, I shouldn't do that. A guilty conscience needs to be dealt with. And if you're, if you're even breaking, and C.S. Lewis makes this, this argument in Mere Christianity in the first chapter. I don't know if he goes beyond that. But in the first chapter, he says, every, every system of morality that you may hold, you will break. Because God writes his conscience on our hearts, right, writes his law on our hearts, in our conscience. And, and we step over that line one way or the other. But what's the point? Why, do, why does that system of restraint need to be in place? Because we were children. Right? Am I making sense? Talk to me. There's five of us. We all need this thing where it says you can't do that. Even, even little kids when they're arguing with, with other little kids about why you have, you have one doll and I have nine, but I have a rule that says I should have ten and you should have none. They'll come up with some good reason or something like that, maybe even violating their own conscience. So Paul says before the person is a Christian, you're in bondage under the elements of the world. There's some kind of morality system, be it it religious or otherwise, that's trying to tell you how to live. There's some list of rules that somebody made up. Maybe mom and dad. Maybe the sports coach. Maybe the vice principal in high school with the big paddle. Back when I went to school, they used to do this. The Board of Education to the Seat of Understanding, right? Boom, boom, boom. There's There's some kind of list of rules that's telling you what you can and can't do, what you should and shouldn't do. And that's, in a sense, childish in that, isn't it better if you can just make the right decision without somebody having to threaten you, right? Don't we want our children to grow up and say, well, of course I'm going to do this because it was right. It doesn't matter that I wouldn't have gotten caught or that nobody was looking. Of course I'm going to do this just because it's right. But until you come to that place of, of, ha- of having the sense to say, I'm doing this because it's right, you need to, p- to have people tell you, you should do this because it's right. And that's what Paul is saying. Now, now, now apply that to the Galatians. They had lived under either some form of Judaism, thinking I need to obey these laws, or even under heathenism or paganism or something, but there was some moral system there telling them maybe they, it was their, they were okay with having ten wives, but you couldn't have that guy's ten wives, or whatever it might have been. There was some system there telling them how to live. And then they're hoping to approach God, whoever he is, by keeping the system of rules that they can't keep and that they're breaking and having to deal with the guilt of their conscience and making New Year's resolutions and all of these things. How am I going to get to this goal, nirvana, God, whatever it might be? You know, how am I going to do this thing? And the gospel comes and says, you can't. In fact, you're guilty. And this guy named Jesus died for your sins. And if you believe that, you'll be born again. And God will bring you, and I'm going to use the phrase here, bring you into adulthood. He will put his spirit inside of you. It's not that the list of rules is bad, guys. It's that you don't want it written in stone. You want it written on your heart, right? The Galatians were going backwards. We need to make sure we're saved. Where's that list again? They were, they were moving away from grace. They were moving away from faith. 
Look at Romans 2, 14 and 15. When Gentiles who do not have the law by nature do the things in the law, these, these Gentiles, although not having the law, are a law to themselves. Not that they come up with the law, but they recognize the laws of God, at least in a, in a, in a basic form, which is written on their heart, they show, verse 15, the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience also bearing witness, and between themselves, their thoughts accusing or excusing them. Everybody somehow knows at some point in their life, thou shalt not murder. Now, if you do that, either you confess it or you find a reason why it was okay. But that's not even the point. The point is that even apart from how you view the act, it was the, the rule or the law was written there in your heart. So if you grew up as a Jew, God, you had God's word. If you grew up as a heathen, it was still there in some basic form written on your heart. That's what Paul is saying here. Look at verse three again. We're gonna move forward. Even so, we, when we were children, we were in bondage under the elements of the world. Kids need rules. And they need enforcers. They need mommy and daddy and timeouts and restrictions or whatever it is. Kids need rules. And that not that just basic living? And, and like I said before, we want our children to grow past that. Now, in accepting Christ, the Galatians had grown past that. But somebody was coming in and saying, you need those rules again. And we're here to help enforce them. And they were going backwards. Let me work through my notes a little bit. Some good ideas here that came out of heaven, dropped into my brain yesterday. <laughs> the person that desires to live under a law is compared to a child living under a guardian. A child doesn't have the capacity to make good internal moral decisions. They need the guardian to tell them what to do and not to do. To tell them if they have been good or bad. A child needs that feedback from the guardian, the mom or the dad, was I good or was I bad? And what are they basing it off of? Did I keep the rules or not keep the rules? Do you love me or not love me? Paul likens, verse number four, the guarded child unto a slave. We read that in verse seven. No authority over himself, subject to governing person or a list, dependent on good behavior to feel approved of. Now just think about a slave a little bit. A slave was property, guys. He could be traded, he could be sold, he could be killed. And the society would say nothing about it because the slave was your property. How did the slave maintain, if he liked his master, if he liked the household, how did the slave maintain his position? By obeying the rules. If he didn't obey the rules, did he feel secure in his position? Think about it, no. If he broke too many rules, He's thinking, you know, I've done really, really well for the last five years, but it's been a bad six months. My master might trade me, sell me, or kill me. So his relationship to his master was all performance-based, wasn't it? That's a nervous way to live. That's a hard, hard way to live. The Galatians were falling back into that. Number five here. The Christian who desires to live under a strict set of rules puts himself into the category of being childish and immature. They look for someone else to tell them how to live, what to do, what not to do, rather than thinking things through and being moved internally, philosophically, and spiritually, they prefer to live by a set of rules. Now, now please receive this with, with the right intentions here. There may be some of us here, followers of Jesus, and you don't want to have to think too much, and you don't want to have to take a step of faith you just want somebody to tell you what to do all the time. You're, and, and maybe, and, maybe and, and, and I run into this, and this is really innocent and very understandable, and I'm not trying to get on anybody's case. This can happen to any one of us. We step out in faith. We believe God's calling us to do something or wh whatever the case may be, and it doesn't work out, and, and we kind of flop and we kind of fail, and suddenly we think, I thought I heard the Lord. Maybe I didn't. I don't dare take that chance again. I don't dare get married again. I don't dare share my faith with anybody at work again. I don't dare whatever the case may be because it failed and it flopped and that was really hard and embarrassing. So uh, I, I just want people to tell me what to do. 
Pastor tell me what to do. Friend tell me what to do. Parents tell me what to do. And, and, and we, we pull away from intimacy with God and just want to color in the lines. Give me my coloring book. Give me my crayons. But I'm so careful to not go outside of the lines, you know. Some kids are like that. They're just, they're just, they're just so careful because they don't want to get in trouble. One of our children colored outside the lines, and you know what? We never actually got mad at them for that. <laughs> Laugh. I mean, we, we, you're a bad child. Your status with the family is very tenuous at this point. We're going to try this again. If you go outside the lines again, you, we may give you the name Smith or something. I don't know. It's no, no offense to any Smiths. I know there's some Smiths there. But you know what I'm saying? We never got mad at our kids because they colored outside the lines. And some of them just, some of them are just like, ha, 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 you know. And the other, oh, just, you know. And, and it's like so careful with life. And, and, and I'm just, I'm putting some thoughts together. They may resonate with you, they may not. Bottom of page one here. Living by a list of religious rules, I think, does the following. It takes away thinking, feeling, and the reasoning aspect of living with God. I understand what it's like to be afraid to make a mistake again. I get that. Speaking about the Christian life, you think you're supposed to do this or do that or talk to this person or whatever, and it doesn't go well, and you're thinking, oh, man, I'm just such an idiot, and I can't do this, and just tell me what to do. I always have to talk about me and Debbie. We just celebrated 32 years in January. Woohoo! I've made a few mistakes. I've made a few mistakes along the way. One of, our, one of our kind of things that we laugh about is sometimes I buy her a present, you know, but I always keep the receipt because <laughs> I don't think like a woman. <laughs> and just sometimes it's just, I just didn't get, I got something. I don't know why she didn't like that fishing pole. It was a beautiful fishing pole. <laughs> I'm making this up, but, but you know, it's, it's that kind of thing. But that doesn't mean I should quit trying to buy Christmas gifts. Because relationship is okay with me making a mistake, right? If I make a mistake with you and we're friends, it's okay. If you make a mistake with me, it's okay. Or at least it should be both ways, right? But sometimes we think with God, if I make a mistake again, oh man, that was a mess last time. Just tell me how to live. Just tell me what to do. Just, I just want to live a confined, non-thinking Christian life. That's not what God has designed us to do, right? So look at the list. If we, if we try to live by religious rules, it takes away thinking, reasoning, feeling, a, re- a relationship with God. It gives us, it, it can, it, conversely, it can also give a false sense of being right with God or being wrong with God. Being right with God, I kept all the rules this week. He must really love me this week. The next week, I broke 10 of the rules this week. He must not really love me this week. He loved you as much one week as he did the next week. But when we have lists of rules, we can imagine that our relationship with God is hot, cold, hot, cold, hot, cold, dependent upon us. And and it's wrong both ways. Is he pleased when we're obedient? Absolutely. Does he love us more? No. For God so loved the rotten, sinful world that he sent his only son, right? So if we live by rules, guys, in your own mind, even things like... New year, I'm going to have a devotional reading schedule. And man, if I miss it, I'm just, I can't blow it this year. I'll, I'll have to wait till January to start again. Oh, I can't do that. <laughs> you know, whatever it might be, I can't miss church. I got to quit smoking. I got to start tithing. I'm just really, I, I have this habit. I just haven't been able to break it. I'm just, you know, uh, I don't know if God loves me as much anymore. Yeah, he does. But if we live by a set of rules like that, we have a false sense of our relationship with God. We may think it's better than it is, or we may think it's worse than it is. He loves you, guys. He loves you. Amen? He loves you. Have a bad day today? He loves you. Have a rotten morning this morning? He loves you. Have a great morning this morning? Great. He loves you. But if we live by rules instead of relationship, that thing can bounce all over the place. Living by a list of rules emphasizes performance over relationship. It also causes us to force our list upon other people. Well, I haven't missed a day of reading, brother, and it's March. How about you? Oh, you've been missing your reading? Well, that's probably why 
the paint on your car is fading or something. I don't, you know. God just can't bless you if you're not reading. And, you know, that, that paint would really be less stirred full. Or if you, just, you know, we start forcing lists on other people when we live by lists. It's just human nature. It also leads to more rule writing. Because if you have ten things that you should do and you fail at three of them, then eight, nine, and ten will now have, now have eight A, eight B, and eight C. Nine A, nine B, nine C so on and so forth, rules for the rules to make sure that you obey the rules. That's human nature. The rule keeper believes the, that more and better rules will lead to success. In reality, it leads to more frustration, blame shifting, denial, condemnation. Guys, can you turn over to the book of Galatians, or excuse me, Colossians. Turn to the right just a few pages. Colossians chapter 2. Excuse me. Colossians chapter 2, verse 20. Paul, Paul is dealing with the same thing uh, in, in this letter. Colossians chapter 2, verse 20. There if, therefore, if you died, and he's speaking to followers of Jesus, and he's speaking spiritually, and you, you, your, your old life's gone, you have a new life in Christ. Therefore, if you died with Christ from the basic principles of the world, there it is again, having to list, live by the ABCs of morality. Why, as though living in the world, do you subjugate yourselves to regulations? Such as, do not touch, do not taste, do not handle, which all concern things which perish with the using, according to the commandments and doctrines of men. These things, very interesting verse here, verse 23, these things indeed have an appearance of wisdom in self-imposed religion. They have an appearance of false humility and neglect of the body, but are of no value against the indulgence of the flesh. You turn back to Galatians. Rules cannot make you holy. Holiness is good, and holy principles are good, and holy commandments are good, but that, that's what we aim for, but we don't do it in the power of our own flesh, and as we, as we work our way through the book of Galatians, Paul's going to be talking in, in Galatians chapter 5 about walking in the, walking in the Spirit. Walking in the Spirit. Laws don't work in leading to holiness or salvation. So what do we, what do we have here? Review, and then we're going to try to do the second half in the, in the minutes that we have left. How do young children live? Under authority, with guardians, and people telling them what to do because they're not mature enough to make their own decisions. They're not wise enough. Spiritually speaking, the parallel is the same for us. When, when you were having a sense of morality as a child and thinking, you know, I, I, I'm tired of doing the wrong thing. I want to do the right thing. And you didn't have Jesus in your life. All you had was you. Maybe you had some friends, so on and so forth. But you had this thing going on inside of you, and it was good. It's good to have a conscience. You know, if you're not a follower of Jesus today, I pray that your conscience doesn't get hard because it can. The Bible says you can harden your heart against God because if you have a guilty conscience for so long, that's a hard thing to deal with. You have to start denying it and blame shifting or anesthetizing yourself so you don't feel the guilt anymore. And that's really, really bad. But that, 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 that pricking of the conscience is a good thing. It shows that there's some spiritual, moral, ethical life still there. It shows that somebody wants to do the right thing and not do the wrong thing. But guys, that's just, as one commentator put it, that's just the ABCs. The ABCs are wonderful, but guess what? You got to put them together and make words. And then you have to put the words together and make sentences and then write books. You don't stay with the ABCs. That's just the start. And having a list of rules is like just having the ABCs. It's just the elementary part. And we can get so disappointed with ourselves, I include, I include myself, that you want to just make a new rule for yourself. Now, God may be speaking to you and prompting you by his spirit to say, hey, uh, uh, it's not a good idea for you to hang out with those people. That's not a rule. That's a prompting of God's spirit. If it was a rule, that means it would be apply to everybody. If I have an anger problem with Bubba Joe, you know, there's nobody here named Bubba Joe, is there? If I have an anger problem with Bubba Joe and God speaks to me and says, hey, you know, stay away from Bubba Joe for a while. 
He's speaking to me. He's not making a rule for all of us. It wouldn't be like the church of anti-Bubba Joe, you know. That would be a rule that everybody should think. So we're talking, does God lead us individually? Absolutely. But rules and lists like that, that are blanketed over the population of God's people, don't make us holy. Let's keep moving. What's God's remedy? Verse 4. When the fullness of the time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law that we might receive the adoption as sons. Fullness of time, verse 4, means at a certain time. Now, we'll never know, I, I don't think, on this side of heaven, everything that that phrase means. But I'm going to suggest some things to you. We'll just read, just read through the notes here. There was a certain time that God chose to introduce Jesus into the world. I'm just going to read the notes. Prophetically, the prophet Daniel had predicted the coming of the Messiah 483 years earlier. Many people believe he predicted Palm Sunday to the day, the day that the Messiah would ride into Jerusalem. So, part of God's timing, the fullness of time. Religiously, Israel, despite having God's word revealed to them, had failed miserably for centuries. They were showing the world, and the world could look at the Jews and see that they were not shining examples of love and grace. They had God's word. They, they had the best that any culture had, and it still wasn't enough because they observed it externally and had not been changed internally. Were some of them saved by faith? Yes. In what God had revealed to them? Absolutely. But just having the word of God doesn't change the heart of man. Historically, Rome ruled the world, the known world, enforced the peace. They had a road system that allowed missionaries to easily travel, propagate the gospel mission message. Greek was spoken commonly in the known world, and it made the sharing of the gospel much easier. Historically, from a human standpoint, there, were, there seems to be kind of a, a perfect convergence of a number of things that God said, now's the time. Is there more than that? I'm sure there probably is. I don't, I don't know what it is. I don't need to know. God sent his son into the world. It says here, when the fullness of time had come, God decided the Messiah is here. Verse four, God sent forth his son. He sent him off. It means to send away. The, the father sent off the son on a mission. Born of a woman, Jesus was fully human. Born under the law, Jesus was born as a Jewish baby. Kept the law perfectly. Never sinned according to the law of God made himself a perfect, holy, unblemished sacrifice for our sins. This is the way the, the Jewish, uh, the, the, the Jewish um, system of offerings was, that if you sinned, you had to bring an unblemished sacrifice. You couldn't bring uh, you know, a crippled, one-eyed, three-legged goat. To, you, know, you had to bring something that was in perfect condition. It had to, it had to cost you something. And in that sense, Jesus was the unblemished, spotless Lamb of God because he kept the law perfectly, an acceptable payment for our sins. And then his righteousness, Book of Romans, put in our account his holiness, his perfection credited to us, not because we earned it, but by faith. So, born under the law, Verse 5, to redeem those under the law, not from under the curse of the law, which he talks about in chapter 3, guys, but from under the basic elements. Okay. Man and wife get married. Guy, the guy's head is as thick as a brick, okay? And he's trying really hard, but he just doesn't get it. And, and he's trying real hard to please his wife, and he just fails miserably time after time after time. And he says, I love you so much, but I just, I just, I'm such a failure, and you're probably better off without me, and maybe we should just call this thing off. And she says, I love you. It's okay. And he says, but I fail you so much. And no, it's okay. I love you. 
well, if you just make me a list of what to do, and she doesn't want a husband that's just like performing to a list. She wants a husband that's going to eventually understand. That'll take 40 years of marriage to understand. But, but that's what she wants, you know. And so the guy is really sincere in everything, but he just kind of doesn't get it. But she doesn't want a relationship with him where she just says, you know, wake up in the morning, say, good morning, honey. How are you? I love you. You look beautiful when you're sleepy. And, I, you know, I mean... Is, that's not relationship, that's just performance. Nobody wants that in marriage or friendship or anything like that. We want to have relationship. And so I believe what, what Paul is talking about here in verse 5, to redeem us who were under the law, he says you don't have to live by the list anymore. This is what God says. You want to be my son? Yeah, but I didn't say anything else. Do you want to be my son? Yeah, yeah. Okay, you're my son. But, but, sh- 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 there's your room. Come join us for dinner. But, 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 but sh- 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 it's all taken care of. Your past is washed away. It's okay. Well, how do I act? Just come sit at the table. You'll learn how the family functions. You'll, you'll get to know the nuances of my tone of voice and, you know, the look on my face and the inflections and you'll see how all the other kids react and you'll learn how to be part of the family. Doesn't that sound better than coming to a table where you're like, is this the salad fork or the meat fork? I mean, look at, guys, look at verse five. To redeem those who were under the list. So we don't have to relate to God anymore by the list. He's given us his name. We are followers of Christ. Let's let's push through this. That we might receive the adoption as sons. You've been taken out of the orphanage and taken into somebody's home and they've given you their name, the family name, if you've said yes to Jesus. We have such a thing in us, don't we, of like, how do I become part of the family? Just by, by accepting the invitation to become part of the family. How do I stay part of the family? By choosing to stay part of the family. But what if I blow it? The family blows it. But what about dad? He's really gracious. (laughs) What about big brother? He died for your sins. Enjoy your adoption. But but isn't, isn't that how we are? It's a beautiful thing when we understand this. Verse six, this is absolutely wonderful. And because you are sons... Because you're daughters, God has sent forth the spirit of his son into your heart, crying out, Abba, Father. Is he our Lord? Yes. Is he our master? Yes. He's also our daddy. He's pops. Whatever, whatever nickname you had for your, for your earthly father, if you had a good relationship with him, he's that to you and more. Absolutely sovereign and holy, omnipotent, omnipresent omniscient, knows everything, everywhere at once, and he's your pops. And you got that way because you said yes to the invitation to be part of the family. You said, I need cleansing. I've, I've, I've sinned. I can't work it off. I've tried the ABCs. I've tried the XYZs. I've tried the whole thing. None of the lists work. He says, good, come into the family. And then he says, by the way, don't go back to the ABCs or the XYZs. That's not how you got into the family. That's not how you stay in the family. You stay in the family, live in my grace, live in my love, and choose to stay in the family. Therefore, verse 7, you are no longer a slave but a son, and if a son, then an heir of God through Christ. Beautiful stuff, isn't it? It's absolutely beautiful. We move from living, guys, religion religion will treat you like a child. Sorry. Even some Christian churches will treat you like a child. Long lists of things that you must do. I'm not saying those things are bad. And I'm not saying there are times that some of us don't need some accountability. But there's, difference, there's a big difference between personal accountability and a list of things for everybody in a group. We want to live in, in a heart response to God. Not according to a list or a set of rules. We could never keep those rules anyway, could we? <laughs> now that we have Jesus, we, we, if we keep that set of rules, it's because he's written them on our hearts and he's prompted us and strengthened us. 
And if we fail, we're not fearful of losing our place in the family because we've been adopted. Guys, okay, here goes the big confession. I blow it sometimes. <laughs> and you know what I can still say? I can still say, Abba, Father, sorry, I know. Can we start over? Yes. Right on. I'm in the family. And his spirit bears witness with my spirit. In my darkest times, in my most discouraged times, his spirit bears witness with my spirit that I'm his son. And if you're a follower of Jesus, you can, you can experience that too. And if you are more adept at, at looking at the, at the list of rules than for listening to his voice, just set the rules aside for a while. Quick story. By the way, if you have any questions, text them in right now. I'll try to answer them. In the early 80s, I started teaching the Bible. And... Uh, I lived by rules. There was a young lady, still know her to this day, her and her husband, my wife and I know them, and uh, she was 15 years old, and she came to me one day, she says, Bill, and I wasn't a pastor yet, I was just teaching a Bible study, she says, we really love your Bible studies. I said, great, and she says, but we always leave feeling really bad. <laughs> because all I was doing was showing them the list and showing them how they hadn't kept it. Now get out there and try harder. Is there a place for trying? Absolutely. But where's the grace and love of God? I did, a, I did a Bible study one time for high school kids. I think there's nine Greek words for the word sin. And I made sure they knew every one of them. <laughs> and God tapped me on the shoulder and says, there's this thing called grace. Maybe you should study that for a while. And I had to put away all my sin studies. I love those sin studies. <laughs> this is just the best baseball bat. You can just wipe people out with them. But I had to put them away and study the love and the grace of God. Because where sin abounds, grace abounds much more. Amen? Any, do we have any questions upstairs, guys? You've talked a lot about what is no value against the indulgence of the flesh, that is, against carnality. So what is the value against, so what is of value against carnality? Why would I want to seek those things which are above? What does it mean to suffer with him? A number of questions here. What is a value against carnality? I don't need, I don't need five plaques in my house that say, thou shalt be patient and not have road rage. And that's just a hypothetical. And... <laughs> I don't need plaques telling me that. I don't need rules. God has written that on my heart, right? Let's say, let's say, let's say I do have a, a problem with people that drive ridiculously slow on the highway. <laughs> there's two of us, one guy, there's three of us. That doesn't mean that you all do. Some of you are just, some of you are that person. <laughs> I wear sunglasses and a makeup when I drive. <laughs> we don't have to make that a rule for everybody in the church. That's just God speaking to my heart. Hey, Bill, calm down and pull over to the right lane. Just relax a little bit. So he's leading me by his spirit. He's not saying, make it a rule, Bill, because you have a problem with it. Make it a rule for the whole church. That's what the, Gala that's what the legalists, the Judaizers, were doing with the Galatians. If you want to be really secure with Jesus, you all have to do this. There's a difference between rulemaking for the body of Christ and individual prompting by the Spirit of God saying, you need to calm down a little bit. You need to not look at this. You need to not talk to him. You need to watch out for this. You need to do a little bit more of this. On a personal level, God will take his word and touch us in that area of our weakness and our propensities but it doesn't have to be a rule for the body of Christ. If we like to keep rules, and I have a trouble with driving fast, then, I'm, then we're going to get slow down, Christian, bumper stickers, and make you all have them on your car or something like that. That would be rulemaking, as opposed to watching that indulgence of the flesh. So what is a value against carnality? God speaking his word into my life, which is already written in my heart, and telling me to be careful with it, but not making a blanket rule for the church. Why would I want to seek those things which are above? The verse goes on to say, where Christ is. Because the things that are above are all about Jesus. He's our elder brother, and that's where the Father is. And so we want to seek those things. We want to be heavenly-minded and increasingly become, as a result, more earthly good. 
what does it mean to suffer with him, uh, uh, doesn't seem to be tied in with that question, if I'm understanding it correctly. Suffering with him might be your enemies are persecuting you and you bless them. Somebody's demanding something of you and you go the extra mile, you turn the other cheek, those kinds of things, not taking revenge. Aligning yourself with Christians who are being defamed at work and being, become guilty by association in the eyes of those who are persecuting a believer at work. Those kinds of, those are, those are mild ways that we might suffer with them. Any, uh, do we have any other questions here? Questions, guys upstairs? To whom are senior pastors accountable? Good question. Um, I'm accountable to, to, I talk to Vince, I talk to Gordon, I talk to Adam. I talk to uh, our board of directors, my wife, first, in front of him. <laughs> of, course, of course, first, obviously, to the Lord. We have had in our bylaws, FYI, um, and we, have, we need to update it because we haven't updated it for a while, but there is an external pastoral review board that, that exists outside of Cornerstone, pre, pre-chosen senior pastors, approved of by me and the board of directors. And um, if I go sideways, or if there are serious complaints against me, uh, those men can be contacted and they will listen to the grievances. And if I'm guilty, I agree ahead of time to step out. If the board is guilty, they agree ahead of time to step out. Or if the pastoral staff is guilty, they agree ahead of time to step out. There's also, re- within the Calvary Chapel movement also, there's regional directors, uh, Damian Kyle from Napa, um, Tim Brown, Rich Chafin. Uh, who else is it, Vince, do you remember? There's five guys, there's five pastors in the region that if there are complaints against Calvary Chapel pastors, and this is the way Calvary Chapel is set up, uh, those men are accessible and available to hear complaints and they review situations. And if they need to deal with a renegade, runaway pastor, uh, they deal with them. And so there is, there is a, a, a network of accountability and um, friendship and relationship that, that is established uh, in my life. Um, can I dodge all of that? Absolutely. I could sidestep it all and make excuses, but you know what? God is not mocked. Whatever a man sows, that he shall reap. And we have seen men explain their way out of this situation, that situation, but God, my life versus Hebrews 12, 6, whom the Lord loves, he disciplines and chastens everyone he calls a son. Great life verse, huh? If we don't have the fear of the Lord, it doesn't matter what, what accountability system we have set in place. It doesn't matter. But if we have the fear of the Lord, like a good dad, he'll discipline us. So there are some things in place for senior pastors. In some, in some churches, there aren't, and we see the abuses of that. If you've experienced that, I apologize. Not because I was part of it, but just because you had to go through it. Anything else? That's it. Let's stand together. If you've said yes to Jesus, then you have his name. You're a son and you're a daughter of God. You've been adopted. And Jesus loved you enough to die for you to get you into the family. And the father loved you enough to send his son to die for you to bring you into the family. And you're a son and you're a daughter of God. And are there family rules? Yes. Are there, are there ways that we interact with each other? Yes. But God writes those things on our heart. So listen to his still small voice. Read his word. Listen to your brothers and sisters because he uses us to exhort one another and, and teach one another. But be, be secure. If you, if you belong to the Lord, if you've said yes to Jesus... He's got you. So stay there. Stay there in his presence. If you've never said yes to Jesus, we want to pray with you this morning. Just come down front afterwards. Thank you, Lord, so much for this time. Thank you for your great love. Thank you um, that we can have relationship with you. We We can hear with ears of faith your voice. We can see you with eyes of faith, sense you with hearts of faith. We can know you. Lord, I pray for your peace and your grace and your mercy to rest upon each one here. 
For those who are incredibly hard on themselves, Lord, may they learn more of your grace. Not to minimize sin, Lord, but to maximize grace. So bless them, strengthen them, encourage them. We love you, Lord. We commit this new year to you, Lord. That's our intention, to live for you today and all these days. Thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name, amen. Bless you guys.